Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus promised that his church would continue to exist right up until his second coming to this earth. Why did he make that promise? So that you could know that somewhere, somewhere on this planet, the church he founded still exists today. But where is it? After his death and resurrection, Christ delivered more details about his church in the book of Revelation. You can read about what he said uh, regarding those seven successive church eras in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. These two chapters are about the saints of God who qualify to marry Jesus Christ. As we've already seen in part one and part two of this series on Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation begins with putting the focus on God the Father. Then the middle of chapter 1 describes the fiery brilliance of the Son, Jesus Christ. Then chapters 2 and 3 describe the Son's bride, which is God's true church. So you have father, son, husband, and bride. What the book of Revelation is describing is the God family and the marriage of the son to his bride is just the beginning of it. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. What do you know about God's church? If you've never really studied the Bible, you've probably heard that it started small with Jesus Christ and the disciples, and then over the centuries it grew and grew, and eventually it became a, a massive, worldwide, universal church. And then in the 1500s or so, protesters uh, broke away from the great mother church, forming hundreds and hundreds of Protestant denominations. And you've been taught that all of these denominations put together make up the traditional Christian church. You've been taught that this is the same church Jesus Christ talked about. Now that's what men say, but what does the Bible say about church history? Jesus, of course, did promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church, as I read to you at the top. But Jesus never said that his church would turn into a massive universal religion. Instead, Jesus said, fear not little flock, little flock. That's in Luke 12 and verse 32. He also said, if they've persecuted me, then they're going to come after you. They're going to persecute you. Now, Jesus obviously suffered intense persecution. We all know this. But so did his true church. The, the true church that, that Christ founded early on, as we'll see here today, it did experience an early spurt of growth from 120 disciples to about 5,000. You can read about it in the book of Acts. But very soon after that initial spurt of growth, the church was struck by intense, intense persecution, just as Christ said it would be. Let's notice Acts chapter 8. We'll just look at some of the the history of, of God's church, as it's discussed in the New Testament, the first century church, as I said, it started off with a, a great spurt of growth, but there was intense persecution early on in Acts 7. You can read about when Stephen was stoned to death for holding on to the truth, for preaching the same message that Jesus proclaimed. And you can see in that same chapter how Saul was there, uh, perhaps uh, overseeing or presiding over that, that persecution. Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, once he changed his course and converted to God's way of life. But notice Acts chapter 8 here, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered 
throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. I mean, everyone was scattered. All the brethren had been scattered away from Jerusalem, everyone except the apostles. Now, this effort to completely stamp out the true church ultimately uh, failed. In fact, there's other verses in the book of Acts that talked about uh, this persecution causing the church to scatter and to spread because of it. But even though it did spread, it never did become a large, uh, dominant organization. It did spread out. It was scattered. And they were persecuted. This is over in Acts 20, a few pages down. Acts 20 and verse 29. This is uh, picking it up toward the, the end of Paul's ministry from his uh, third missionary journey. As he was passing through Ephesus, he brought all of the elders in that region of Asia together for sort of a conference. And it says here in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing uh, the flock, it says in verse 30, uh, also of your own selves. I mean, Paul's addressing the ministry in the true church, and he's talking about grievous wolves arising right in their midst. And he says, some of you are going to become those false ministers. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, verse 31, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I mean, he gave this strong warning to the ministers in the true church, saying that the, perse the real persecution, the real deception you want to be concerned about is what comes from within. Of course, there's going to be some persecution and resistance that comes from without from time to time. But what really brought the growth of the first century church to a standstill was this deception from within. Now, Ephesus, you know about these seven church eras we've been talking about in Revelation 2 and 3. We'll get to Revelation 2 in just a little bit. Ephesus, though, is that first era. Now, in, in the history, uh, there in the first century, Ephesus was a, a leading congregation, and it was, in many ways, it served as uh, sort of the regional office for uh, the Apostle Paul's work throughout the Mediterranean region. The regional office for the Gentile work initially was in Antioch, not that far north, really, from Jerusalem. But as the work pushed westward, then it became necessary for a more central location to serve as the regional office. Jerusalem, as we've seen, was, uh, was facing a lot of persecution. A lot of the brethren there will be, were being scattered away. This was, of course, building up to uh, Jerusalem being sacked by uh, Titus, the, the Roman general, there around 69, 70 AD. And so uh, about that time, there in the Gentile region, Ephesus was uh, the center of Paul's work, as I said. So it's not uh, some coincidence that that first era, as it's called in Revelation 2, is named Ephesus. Jesus named it that because that area, that region, that office or that regional office and the region around it, that was to serve as a type of really the entire first century era of God's church. Now, coming back to Acts 20 here, what we read, you can see how Paul knew, he knew that much of the early work of these apostles, whether in Jerusalem or in the region of Asia, Asia or throughout the Mediterranean region, he knew that much of their early work was to be undone, basically, by intense persecution, by satanic deception. Let's look, look over at 2 Peter uh, 2. Paul wasn't the only one who knew this. If you go through the, the New Testament letters, you can see a common theme throughout all of them. These servants of God, these apostles of God, warning God's people of, of the deception, of the persecution that was to come from within. This is 2 Peter 2, 
and uh, verse 1, it says, But there were uh, false prophets also among the people, uh, even as there shall be false teachers among you, Peter says, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Here they were right among the people. That word privily, if you study into it, it means that they, they came in secretly or surreptitiously. They came, I mean, it was an inside job, in other words. Verse 2, it says, And many, many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. See, they spoke evil of the truth. They corrupted the truth. And many brethren followed after them. These weren't atheists that were coming at the church of God saying, believe us, there is no God. These were people coming in, talking a lot about God, talking a lot about Jesus Christ and deceiving a lot of people. Verse 3 continues, uh, and through covetousness, it says, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, you brethren, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. You see, he's saying here that the church would suffer from a crippling attack from these, these false ministers within the church, and that many, as we read there in verse 2, many would follow after their destructive ways. Now let's, let's go back to one of Paul's letters, the book of Galatians, and just see what it is that he said to the brethren in the, the region of Galatia. This is probably, I mean, it's, it's hard to get an exact date on all these letters that Paul wrote, but this is probably one of the earlier ones that he wrote, perhaps in the, around about 50 A.D., maybe in the early 50s, some 20 years or so into uh, the New Testament church. This is Galatians 1 here and verse 6. He says, I marvel that you, you brethren, are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. They had been moved to another gospel. It was still religious. It, it still was Christian sounding. But it wasn't the gospel that Jesus taught. It wasn't the gospel that Jesus preached. There were ministers that came along preaching another gospel. And many of the brethren were moved to that false gospel. And Paul was just beside himself. I marvel that it could just happen so soon that you could get away from what I taught you, brethren. I can't believe it. Let me show you what Herbert Armstrong wrote in his book, Mystery of the Ages. He's talking about this first century history and this passage we read here in particular from Galatians. He said, soon a violent controversy arose over whether the gospel to be proclaimed was the gospel of Christ, which was Jesus' gospel or good news about the kingdom of God, or whether they should preach a gospel about Christ, merely preaching the acceptance of Christ as Savior, it says, as apostasy from Christ's truth gained momentum, much of the church was turning to a different and counterfeit gospel, proclaiming Christ as Savior, but omitting entirely that sin is the transgression of God's spiritual law and the good news of the kingdom of God, the removal of Satan and the restoration of the government of God over the earth and the final opening of salvation to all of humanity who, when judged, would repent, believe, and receive eternal life as sons of God, as actual God beings. See, these are the truths that they were turning away from as the gospel turned into just this, as he explains, just this simple acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior, but while omitting these massive truths about God's purpose and plan for mankind. We can just read it on the screen here, Jude 1 and verse 4. Here's another one of uh, the early teachers in the church. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old uh, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, they turned God's grace into a license to just do whatever you want. Well, God's grace covers it. 
well, the sacrifice of Christ covers it. And so they do away with the law, they do away with the commandments and so on. And as Paul explains, I mean, this is, this is another gospel. This isn't the gospel that Jesus proclaimed. Jesus himself said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and, and you don't do the, the things I say? You don't do what I teach. Another instance in uh, Matthew 19, a young man came to him and said, you know, what must I do to, uh, to be in your kingdom, God's kingdom, on earth? And Christ told him to keep God's commandments, to submit to God's law. Not that we can earn our way into God's kingdom, but we certainly aren't going to make it into the kingdom by just continuing to live in sin. The Israelites never would have made it into the promised land had they just continued to stay in Egypt. They had to get up and move out. And all of that is a type of our spiritual journey. We've got to leave the world behind and live anew. It's a process. It takes a lifetime to overcome and to conquer sin with God's help and power living in us. Coming back to Galatians 1 here. Just read the following verse, verse 7. It says, speaking of this false gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you uh, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Notice that. They come in and pervert the truth. It's not that they say, look, we're anti-religion. We're, we don't want to have anything to do with God. We're atheists. We don't believe in God. These are believers, quote unquote, who come in and they change the gospel. They corrupt the gospel. They pervert the gospel. That's what Paul was warning these people uh, about, that same verse in the Revised Standard. Not that there is another gospel. <laughs> let me be clear. They're going around preaching another gospel, but let me tell you, there is no other gospel. There's just the one that Jesus taught, that Jesus preached, the gospel, the good news message of the coming kingdom of God. Now let's go over to 2 Corinthians. Also, one of Paul's writings, Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians 11, and we'll start here in verse 3. It says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul was afraid for their well-being. And notice how they were corrupted away from the simplicity of Christ's message. It says in verse 4, for if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. I mean, there's going to be other ministers coming, preaching another gospel, uh, talking about another spirit, talking about you know, the, the, all these religious themes. But none of it, of course. The truth, the truth of God, uh, down in verse 13, it says this whole religious system for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You see, they made themselves out to be Christ ministers, but they were imposters. They were false ministers. You can study in Acts 8 and see uh, how this movement got started by Simon Magus. You can read about him in Acts 8 and you can read about him in secular history. If you have a commentary or an encyclopedia, uh, that's old enough. A lot of it's been revised out of the newer translations or the newer productions. But you can read about that history, what Simon Magus established, this great counterfeit that he set up, how he tried to buy his way into the church, how he tried to buy his way to receiving the Holy Spirit, how he tried to buy his way to to receiving the power that the apostles had, that the authority that God had given them. He wanted or fancied himself as very religious. He took a lot of those Babylonian customs there in the land of Samaria and just put nice religious sounding names on them. How else do you ex explain Again, going back to what I said at the top, all these hundreds of denominations with these differing ideas about the future, uh, about what the Bible actually means, about what we're to obey, what we're not to obey, and that that collection, 
of all of these disparate parts or supposedly together the, the, the great Christian church? That's just nothing but confusion. Verse 14 continues, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that Satan would have a false system of, of religion. I mean, he is, after all, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says. He has, after all, deceived the whole world. Are we to assume that he's deceived every bit of the world except for the massive Christian world? Verse 15, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as, as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. See, Satan is the god of this world. He's the god of religious confusion and strife. He's the god of religious war, which we've seen so much of in man's history. God isn't behind that, of course. Satan is, because he's the god of this world. One more letter from the Apostle Paul. This is in uh, 2 Timothy, one of the last um, letters Paul wrote, the last letter that he wrote. He was in jail. He was about to lose his life. He was about to be beheaded because of the truth that he preached. Paul's ministry was not uh, an easy life. It wasn't the smooth and easy way to go. It was fraught with difficulty and hardship, one obstacle after another. He wrote about those things in his, in his letters, the things that he suffered for the, the work's sake. And, and notice what he says here in 2 Timothy 1 and, and verse 13. It says, Hold fast the form of sound words. He's writing this to his assistant, which you have heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Hold on to these words. Hold on to these truths. So many people are letting go of them, Timothy. You make sure you hold on. Stay grounded in the truth. Don't let an imposter come along and tell you that what I taught you, it actually means something different now. Don't fall for that. Stay grounded. Keep your nose in the Bible. Verse 14, it says, That good thing which was committed unto you, keep by the Holy Spirit which dwells in us. Guard it. Hang on to it. Make sure it's all based on the Word. You can read Isaiah 8 and verse 20 on your own time. To the law and testimony. I mean, if it doesn't, if it doesn't hold up to God's Word, then there's no light in those preachers. If it's not based on God's Word, there's no light in them. That's what Isaiah said. God says, prove all things. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. He didn't say, just sit there and and take whatever it is that man says and accept it as the truth. We'll see in just a second when we get to Revelation 2 how that God praised the, the, the Ephesus era for trying the apostles and, and making sure that they were real apostles because they were false apostles. Verse 15, it says, This you know, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are uh, Phagellus and Hermogenes. So everyone in Asia, I mean, this was a thriving metropolis. The Ephesus area, all those other seven churches that are, are mentioned in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. In, in history, I mean, they were all situated there in Asia. What is modern day Turkey? He had congregations all throughout the region, Paul did. And ministers, probably dozens of ministers, and here he is at the end of his life. And what does he, what does he say to Timothy? Uh, don't worry, Timothy, it's all spread. It, it's turned into an enormous church. It's now spreading all across the region. Uh, we've got a good foundation set up. Instead, he says, Timothy, everyone's left. Everyone's left the church. Everyone's left the truth. How come you don't hear about that when you hear about the history of the true church? It's right in your Bible. You can read it just as sure as I just read it to you. That's the true history of the first century church. This, you know, that all they which are in Asia are turned away from me. And then, of course, Paul is about to lose his head 
does this, I mean, this is now moving toward the late 60s AD. The church was established in 31 AD. I mean, really what we're seeing here is that the true church early on had about a 20, 30 year run before intense persecution nearly stamped it out altogether. Now Christ promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He promised that it would continue. But as we can then see from Revelation 2 and 3, as each era nearly died out, God would then raise up another one. That's the true history of God's true church, the church that Jesus Christ uh, himself established. Now, let's go over to Revelation 2. Of course, this first era is unique in that we can get a lot of context and backstory from the rest of the New Testament because the Ephesus era, of course, was that first century era that all of the New Testament was, was uh, written in and compiled during that first century, the very church era that Jesus established. This is Revelation 2 now in verse 1. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the, the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. We've already covered this in the earlier parts of this series. How that with God's church, Jesus Christ is, is represented as being right in the middle, right in the midst of the church. But when that church went astray, the lamp went out. Jesus Christ left. That has been the history of God's church. Verse 2, it says, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And you found them liars. He's, he's praising them for what they did early on. When they, they proved who the true apostles were, and they pointed out the false apostles. And they said, that, that apostle over there that's talking all this about Jesus Christ, this and that, he's a liar. He's not telling the truth. And God says, I want to commend you for that. Problem is, they, they didn't continue with that diligent study, making sure that everything those apostles said was based on the sure word of God. They didn't continue, as we'll see here in this same uh, section of scripture, verse 3 continues, and have borne and have patience, and for my name's sake you have labored and have not fainted. I mean, these were, they, they were off to such an impressive start. They started with great, with great power as a church era. I mean, it was established by Jesus himself. And then all these disciples who became apostles that were trained personally by Jesus Christ continued. But then what happened? After Paul is persecuted and killed, or Peter, or John sent off in exile to Patmos. Even the apostles were either killed or scattered. All the people in Asia left. Well, that era nearly died out, and you can see in the next verse why. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. You see, God didn't leave them. If the church is focused on the Father, if the church is striving for holiness and obedience toward God, then Christ is right in the midst. But when that church leaves, that's what it says here in verse 4, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. You stopped loving the way that you did at the start. Loving God's work, loving God's people, loving this whole world, loving the truth. Studying the truth, pouring your heart into your studies, your prayers, your support for the work. They lost that. They lost their love for the true gospel. They lost their love for true education. They couldn't get excited about God's work like they used to. And so what happened? That era died. That's what happened. And God had to intervene and raise up. A new era, verse 5, it says, Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will uh, come unto you quickly, and will remove your candlestick out of his place. See, remember what you did at the start. Remember those first works. 
as we go through this study of Revelation 2 and 3, we'll see that in era after era of God's church, it's a repeated fact that after the first or second generation moves along, the, here comes the second and third generation that's, that's more spoiled and takes things for granted, doesn't just really dig into God's Word like the, um, the ancestors did. And then sure enough, uh, whole entire churches turn to error, to heresy, to false teachings. And what does God say He'll do when that happens? He says, I'm going to come in and remove the candlestick, the lamp. The light's going to go out. And I'll have to move it elsewhere. This is why it's important, as I covered in the last episode, that we keep the fire burning whether you look at it individually or collectively, that we keep that lamp burning, that we let our lights shine for God. Finally, verse 7 says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. They had gotten away from the simplicity of Christ, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians. And here it says they got away from the tree of life, what God intended to teach Adam and Eve from the very beginning, but what Adam and, Adam and Eve rejected. And they instead took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says if you get back to that tree of life, if you work to conquer, to overcome, to submit to God, then we can dwell right in the midst of the paradise of God. There's a reprint article I want to draw your attention to just because of what we ended with here in verse 7. The mystery of the two trees. It's an excellent, excellent article about how the foundation of not just the church, this, this whole world started, how it, how it was established, what God intended, and then what happened there early on when Adam and Eve rejected God's authority and rule and chose instead to go their own way. And what sprung from them in terms of civilization? <laughs> it's not God's society. It's not God's civilization. Not hardly. That's coming, though. The mystery of the two trees. You could call the number on your screen there to get your free hard copy if you'd like. Or you can go to thetrumpet.com and download uh, your copy today. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on The Trumpet Daily. <laughs>